so I am Ben Porter. Um, I work in the bioengineering department and helped uh, get this together, but this is the let's grit to it, preparing yourself for the job search. Uh, this is the first in a series of talks that we're going to be giving over the week. Um, the goal of which, why is that doing that? Sorry, trying to get rid of the. Ah. Beth, make it go away. I don't make that go away. Oh, okay, awesome. Okay, uh, all part of our summer prep series. So, um, really, the goal of this is to kind of get everybody in the right mindset. So, if I don't have an internship, if I don't have a job lined up, what can I do to start getting myself ready for all of this? Uh, even if you do have a job lined up or an internship, or an internship lined up, this is supposed to kind of take you beyond that. So, really, it's it's to help prepare you to get ready for the actual job search, the actual job applications, and and things like that. So. Uh, today is the let's grit let's grit to it where we'll talk about uh, kind of mentally preparing yourself and doing some previous research um, tomorrow we will have a student panel uh, an alumni panel that will talk about how to make small experiences resume worthy so that's really going to be focusing on now that you have an idea of what sort of skills you should be developing uh, how can you go fulfill those how can you build up experiences to that that aren't necessarily those, those internships um, or uh research experiences on wednesday um we'll talk about translating those experiences into what employers want um so a better way to probably describe this is if you've been working at mcdonald's for the past two years uh, and you're trying to figure out how to make that relevant to the job that you're applying for we're going to be talking about how to make those into resume ready bullet points um, and then on Thursday, we're going to wrap up with speed networking. So networking is a key major component of finding a job. Um, so this will be a good practice for it. And hopefully you'll meet some other people also trying to build up these experiences that you can might be able to collaborate with. Okay. Our schedule for today, uh, we have four speakers, four different sections. So as I said, I'm Ben Porter. We'll talk about keeping a positive attitude. Uh, we have deconstructing a job description with Jason Cirillo from the JSON Career Management Center. Uh, how to develop your skills at UTD with Andrea Crosdale Wedwick, and then finding the right people to network with with Beth Keithley. So with that, I'm going to jump right into my section on keeping a positive attitude so we stay somewhat on schedule. Um, so keeping a positive attitude, a lot of this comes down to when I think about a job search, some of the descriptors that I come up with are it's time consuming, uh, it's hard, it tends to be a roller coaster of emotions, um, you need to be very active in it and it's ongoing. There's probably plenty of other words and topics that you can associate with it, but when I sat down, these are kind of the ones that I thought of. Um, so I want to go into a little bit more on these. So it's time consuming. The average job search takes about five to six months. I actually had an advisor tell me once that it would take about a month. He was very wrong. Um, it takes a lot longer than that. So if you're approaching it thinking that you're going to graduate and immediately find a job, that's not how it works at all. Um, so you definitely need to be thinking about it a lot earlier in your careers, uh, in your academic careers. So I like to tell my students, start thinking about it in the first year uh, when you're an undergraduate. So your very first year you're here, you should start planning on this. Um, there is a general recommendation out there that you apply for two to three jobs per day. Now, if you think about it, if it takes a job search five to six months and you're doing two to three job applications per day, that's about 10 to 15 per week or 40 to 60 per month, or 200 to 360 job applications over the entire time that you're looking for a job. That's not necessarily a realistic number, but that kind of gives you the idea of the effort that you should be making on this, the, the level of effort you should be putting into going out, searching for and applying for jobs. Um, that is extremely time consuming. Um, most jobs also have several rounds of interviews. It's not like they look at your application, call you up once, and then you've got it. Sometimes it happens, but most of the time not. Most of the times it's two or three rounds of interviews. Um, and then even after they say that they want to hire you, it could take a couple of weeks. So um, it is a very time consuming process. It's also hard. 80% um, of jobs are filled through networking with personal and professional connections. So that's great if you have those connections. If you don't, that means a lot of jobs are going away to people who know people, okay? which is why networking is so important. Related to that, 70% of the jobs are said to never be posted. So if they are posted, it, it, a lot of times they're also already filled because of that networking, right? People who know people 
They have to post it because they're required to. They post it, but they already know who they're going to hire. OK, so again, if you've already networked and you're connected, great. Otherwise, kind of sucks. OK, um, and then another thing that can make it harder for our non connected people are employee referrals typically get interviews 50% of the time. So that means if you are applying for a job at UTD and I refer you, most of the time, most of the people I would recommend, 50% of them are going to get an interview. 20% of them would get hired. Okay. Um, now, that's great to know ahead of time because you can go out and start building these relationships, right? You can start trying to network ahead of time. But the key thing is you actually do have to build up these relationships. You can't just ask a faculty member who knows somebody who works in a company, hey, can you have them do an employee referral because they're putting their name on the line for you. They have to know you. OK, um, so that is challenging and also time consuming to build up these relationships. It is most definitely a roller coaster of emotions. Um, often it feels like it's on fire. Okay? Uh, there is this constant barrage of excitement and disappointment and waiting and excitement and disappointment and waiting. It's really easy to get discouraged during the job, job search. I have a lot of students who will turn to me and, and they're just flat out depressed. And I get that. It really is a beat down when you're trying to find a job and you need one, um, especially if you have to have it like right now. You need the job, right? Bills are stacking up. You got to find it. Nobody's biting. So um, you have to have the positive attitude. Knowing going back that, yes, it does take five to six months. It is possible. You will find a job. It's not possible you will find a job. I'm saying you will find a job. OK, it'll take time um, and it may look a little different than you're expecting, but you will find a job. So it's not a question of don't be depressed that you don't have one yet. Know that you will get one. There is an end goal that you're working toward and it's almost guaranteed that you'll have it. OK, things that you can do to make your life easier so you're not depressed as much uh, or worried or stressing out about it is start early. So I mentioned starting in the first year, um, start early before you need the job. OK, um, have outlets so that you don't obsess. If that's the only thing you're doing is applying for a job every day, like that's the only thing you're doing, you're, you're unemployed, nothing else is going on, you're going to go crazy. OK, because you're going to keep applying for the jobs, nothing's happening. So have outlets, go do other things. Uh, and that relates back to building the experiences, which we'll be talking about here soon. Uh, and then be sure you take care of yourself. Um, health wise, right? Get the exercise, go out, eat right, all that sort of thing. That'll help. The job search is also active. Okay? Uh, I mentioned that you apply for a lot of jobs, but it's not necessarily a numbers game. It's about the quality of the applications that you turn in, right? Um, if you are unemployed, I think the number that I saw that you should be spending is eight to 10 hours a day applying to jobs. Remembering that's only for two to three jobs per day that you're applying. So you're spending a lot of times per job, right? Three to four hours applying to a single job. That's because you should be tailoring your resume to that job. You should be doing your research about that company, learning about what they want and trying to do your best to convince them that you are it. OK, um, so it's about the quality of the application. It's also not a waiting game. Just because we say it's five to six months doesn't mean you can kind of sit back and just keep hitting the submit button. It's about building those relationships. So we talk about a lot with networking. You have to build that network. So it is a long haul build up to it, but it's not just a waiting game. You have to be active in that. Um, so you do have to be active and engaged. Planning ahead helps to shorten that time. So if we're talking about starting in your first year of your master's or the first year of your undergraduate or anything like that, then it adds up. I mean, we're talking about four years, two years and the overall process of trying to find the job. But if it's that five to six months of unemployment that you're comparing it against, if you've done all this work ahead of time, you may have absolutely no unemployment by the time you graduate because you could be going straight into a job. The other thing is the quality of the job that you're going into, that increased level of satisfaction because you've taken the time to build up all your experiences and skills that you need. You've taken the time to make yourself attractive to the employers who are out there looking for you. So planning ahead actively and getting engaged will increase that job satisfaction with that first job that you get. Um, and then create your own luck. That's just kind of the idea behind all of this. It always seems when people get hired that they were so lucky, they're talking to the right person at the right time and all, all this other stuff. That's not really it. They have put themselves and built up their experiences to get themselves into that position where they're talking to the right people at the right time. So you have to create your own luck in that way. All right. 
OK. Couple factors that are outside your influence. When we talk about the length of the job hunt and all of that, some factors that are kind of outside of your purview, something you can't really control, right? The job market. You can't really control the job market. Right now, we're doing pretty good, but who knows what's going to happen next year, OK? Um, which is why it's good to be ready with your materials pretty much at all time. Have those relationships already built so you don't have to rely on it being a good job market. You can rely on the people you know needing people. Time of year does absolutely influence it. If you know the time of year when the companies are hiring, try to plan around it. Uh, your field, definitely. If you are a specialist in particle physics, then there's not very many jobs out there for you. At least I don't think there are. I don't know about particle physics, but it sounds very specialized. Okay. As opposed to if you are in management and you're a marketing student, everybody needs marketing, right? So there's a lot more opportunity there. So your field will definitely influence that. Your commitments. So by this, I mean, if you already have family commitments going on, uh, you have parents who need taken care of, you have children, things like that, those are pretty much outside your influence, right? Yes, they are yours, but they're there. You can't just ditch them. Uh, well, you do what you do, but I, okay, I can't just ditch mine, okay? Uh, and the geography and location. For some people, they are tied down. We talked about those previous commitments. If you have elderly parents you can't move away from or anything like that, then you're kind of locked into your geography. Okay, so let's talk about the things that you can influence. Things that will make your job search easier or shorter. The things that you can try to address now with proper planning. So I said geography. I'll say it again now. Uh, it's one of those things that you can change. If you're not tied down by family, this is the perfect time in your life to go out and explore to go out and try different places. Um, you may end up moving back to the region where you wanted to come from. If everybody here is uh, born in Dallas and they want to stay in Dallas, go explore a bit, then come back. Go check it out before you do. Um, getting that experience also makes you a lot more attractive as an employee, especially if you travel abroad, if you're going international, because now you have international experience. Flexibility, I, uh, I group there with geography because you can take on jobs that you wouldn't necessarily take on when you're further in your career. Uh, I wouldn't want to travel a lot right now. I'm not going to go into consulting where I have to travel a lot. At an earlier stage in your career, it's easier to go travel a lot and it's a lot more fun. Um, so take advantage of that. Be, be flexible in the different things that you're looking for. Application materials need to be absolutely air free. Um, that is one of the biggest reasons that you will get your resume rejected. It's just a simple mistake. Uh, if your email address is unprofessional, it's one of the bigger reasons that people will just kind of kick it out if it doesn't have a professional sounding email address. Uh, and it should be tailored. You have to tailor it to the companies. That definitely shows through. Your experience or lack thereof or your length of unemployment, both of those things can also influence how long it takes for you to get hired. You can build experience without necessarily having to get a job or an internship already. And that's part of the reason we're doing this entire series is to talk about that. Length of unemployment. Yes, you can be unemployed, but yes, you can also volunteer and do other things within that time to fill it. So it's not just to show that you're, you've wasted that time. Your online presence. Uh, most everybody probably knows this, but having a LinkedIn account and having it up to date and filled in uh, on the flip side, Controlling your social media and your presence there. I know when I was doing hiring for all of our final candidates, I would definitely go do a Google search on them. Uh, I want to make sure they're not going to misrepresent the department in a bad way or anything like that. So yeah, I will go search on people. If I can dig up that you've been to too many drunken parties and doing all sorts of bad stuff, that might reflect negatively. Okay. Um, your search methods. If you're only using LinkedIn or if you are only using Google, uh, not Google, sorry, Monster, or only just using Handshake. You should be using multiple ways and not just the search engines, but going out and looking up the individual companies that you want to apply to. A lot of that comes back to that networking because you're supposed to be working your way through multiple avenues to get to these jobs. So it really is kind of strategizing in several ways. And then your attitude. Um, you got to stay positive, okay? It is a beat down. Um, it can be really hard and really discouraging, but keeping in mind you're going to get a job. Um, and in the end, it will be a good job or you will lead to a good job. The outcome is there. Okay, Keep that positive attitude uh, and it'll make life a lot easier for you. 
The last thing that I mentioned was that it's ongoing. Uh, your first job is most definitely not your last. So even after you get the job, you will be continuing this. You will be continuing strategizing, getting ready for your next step, getting ready to move up the, the ladder to management or whatever it is you want to go do. Um, but the first job is not your last. So this should always be ongoing. OK, that was my portion. I ran over by two minutes. Sorry about that. Um, but now I am going to pass it over to Jason. And he's going to talk about destruct, deconstructing a job description. I can't talk, so it's good that he's going to. So welcome, Jason. Thank you. Um, who do we have? Just have to, do we have a clicker? Um, nope, we're doing it the old fashioned. All right. Cool. <laughs> pushing the button. No worries. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Jason Cirillo uh, from the JSOM Career Management Center. Uh, JSOM is a uh, is fortunate enough to have its own uh, career center, and and that's where I come from. So we focus specifically on the JSOM students. Um, we uh, are essentially all from the corporate world. So just to give you an example, so you know I'm not just a random person up here talking about this stuff. Uh, previous to teaching, uh, I used to be a campus recruiter for a tiny computer company, uh, Hewlett Packard, and uh, I had the opportunity to travel around to universities and meet students and do interviews and shake hands and uh, uh, write offer letters, and negotiate salaries, all that good stuff. Um, so I bring a lot of that experience um, into the classroom now. And um, today we're going to talk about what it is uh, when we read a job description. Um, and I think it's important before we really get into um, how to, you know, some examples of how to break apart a job description. I think it's important to understand where a job description even comes from in the first place. So right now, um, there's a lot of conversations going on about jobs that are going to be posted in the future. OK, now for a lot of the companies that post um, at that, that, you know, in, in the uh, for JSON majors, a lot of these business majors, um, companies that hire business majors, a lot of the recruiting happens in the fall. And that's why often you see the big careers, big career fairs and conferences and stuff like that happen in the fall. All that recruiting is done then. A lot of the offers are made anywhere between, you know, October, November, December ish. And those offers are going to start either in January or May of that next year. Side note, some companies are recruiting even earlier these days. We actually just had uh, Goldman Sachs on campus a couple week a couple weeks ago, and they were recruiting for their May 2023 20, uh, internships already. So just to kind of give you an idea, some of these companies, they go really early um, because they want the talent quick and they want it. They want to get to the talent first. Um, so for you as as the students and the talent, you guys are the winners because you have companies fighting over you, right? So um, right now, all these conversations are going on when it comes to uh, jobs being posted in the future. Now, when a job is is ready, okay, there's all sorts of approval levels that goes through and all that kind of stuff. It's not so easy for some companies to say, hey, we need an intern. Let's get a job posted, right? There's usually all this other stuff that happens in the background. But eventually something happens called uh, what often is called an intake call. Now the recruiter, OK, that was my job, campus recruiter, will set up uh, what they sometimes call an intake call with the hiring manager for whatever job is being posted. During this conversation, the recruiter is trying to figure out what are the types of things that this manager is looking for uh, before they hire this person. So questions that the recruiter might ask are, what are the nice to haves? What are the must haves? Um, if we had an intern here, or if we had, you know, a person do this job before, if, you know, if it's a, if it were for backfilling, uh, why? What happened to this person that was in this role before? Did they move up? Did they leave? What, what happened? Uh, if they were in this, if, if this is a, a, a previous, uh, like a backfill, somebody moved on or whatever, what was great about them? What didn't you like about them, right? The recruiter is trying to gather a picture uh, in all these requirements to determine exactly what the hiring manager is looking for. Because ultimately, the recruiter 
is going to be in charge of looking at the market and determining, you know, can we find this type of person that you're looking for? Uh, can we, are they going to be okay with what we're going to pay them and all that good stuff? But first they need to know what is the hiring manager looking for? That happens in the intake call. After the intake call, the recruiter will take all those notes and oftentimes companies have templates of jobs that they've posted before. So the company or the recruiter can take those notes from that uh, intake call, put them into this template, rewrite it so it you know fits that job, and then that's what you see posted online. Okay. So to understand where the job description even comes from in the first place, um, I think that's important, or I should say I feel that's important because um, they're asking for very, very specific things in these job descriptions. And many times they're written very specifically for a reason, which is why it's really important, as Dr. Porter said, to tailor your resume to these jobs that you're applying to. And that's also why, and Dr. Porter mentioned, don't get stuck with just apply, 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 because then you sort of get into this uh, thing. It's it's kind of like throwing spaghetti at the wall and just kind of seeing what sticks, right? And that's not a good strategy at all. Next thing you know, you're, you know, 500 applications in, you're waking up to rejection emails every day, and, uh, you know, then we're getting the bait team and wondering <laughs> what's going on, right? So that's where the description, uh, the job description uh, is going to come from in the first place. Now, I wanted to show you guys this as well, because um, uh, this comes from uh, NACE. <clears throat> now, NACE is uh, the National Association of Colleges and Employers, and it's uh, a, um, a really great organization that all you really need to know is that it helps us understand what companies are looking for. Um, that's one of the things they do. But this is a survey that they put out for their uh, employer partners. Now, these are Fortune 500 companies. And these are some of the things that these employers were saying that they want to see on your resumes this year. OK, now this list changes you know, slightly every year. But the reason I include this in here is because you see a lot of these words in job descriptions, right? And oftentimes, I think that students kind of overlook this kind of stuff because they say, yeah, of course, I'm a great problem solver. You know, I know that, you know, they should know that. Right. Of course, I'm a great team player, that kind of stuff. But when we talk about some of these job descriptions um, and then later when we kind of learn about, you know, how to find these examples, you're going to see that, you know, there's a, the, this whole process is tied together in such a way that not only are they asking for teamwork in the job description, but then they want to see res, uh, actual examples of teamwork in your resume. And then when you get into the job interview, they want to hear stories of this teamwork, right? So um, ultimately, again, all these pieces of the puzzle are sort of tied together. Um, and these are things that you're going to have to pay attention for as you're looking at these job descriptions. And I wanted to uh, let's see if we can get this. Uh, thing to kind of disappear. Uh, oops. You might not be able to. Oops. Well, I'm all over the place here. All right. How about we do that? Oh, wait. Now we're going all over the place. Oh, here we go. Okay. We just jumped ahead. All right. Um, well, that's fine. Okay. So these are actual job descriptions that I pulled um, from the World Wide Web's and these are um, things that you're going to often see when you're out there applying for jobs. Now, I'll give you kind of a hint here. When you're applying to stuff immediately, and I get, I get it, you guys got a million and one things going on. The last thing you're going to want to do is start to read about all the fluff language that they kind of put in the top. But here's the reality of it. <clears throat> There's a highly paid or maybe sometimes underpaid marketing team that writes this stuff. And a lot of these companies are required, they require every recruiter to put that into the job description. It's their company branding. So in my opinion, if they're paying money to have this kind of stuff on there, it's stuff you should be paying attention to. And one of the biggest reasons, uh, aside from, you know, uh, knowing what to put in your resume, this also kind of gives you ideas on what the job interview process might be like, what kind of questions might come up uh, in that process. You know, um, 
you know, you, we the, we put together this entire series, and and it's always kind of like again these puzzle pieces. What comes next? Uh, whenever you're going through this whole process, don't just you know say okay, I'm going to click apply and then look away. Think about what happens after you click apply, and you get a you get a phone call for a job interview, and then they you know what kind of stuff is going to happen in that, right? How can I, you know, prepare myself in case that kind of stuff happens, right? So again, always be thinking ten steps ahead. Is really, what I'm trying to say. But let's take a look at uh, this job description here. Um, as we can see, you know, kind of up at the top about our team. IT team consists of members who work cooperatively in a professional environment, encourages initiative, positive attitudes, and collaboration. So immediately on your resume, right, I might be as a recruiter, I might be looking for examples of, of this kind of stuff. Now, by the way, these are all like entry level or internship type postings. So a lot of times those are written a little bit differently because they know they're being written for students. Right. So. Those are some of the first things that that are going to pop out to you, hopefully. What else do you guys notice um, in those maybe that uh, second and third paragraph? Are there any other skills that pop out? What's that? Collaboration. Collaboration, okay. You know, as an FYI, kind of a side note, one of the interesting things too is look how many times they say the same thing over and over again. What do you think if they say it over and over again, what do you think you can imply from that? It's probably pretty important to them, right? One thing I see there is um, actually providing mentoring to support professional development as well as contribute new ideas. So as you're writing your resume, ask yourself, where can I provide an example of contributing a new idea? But then, you know, take it a step further. Think about the job interview. Tell us, describe a situation in which you uh, contributed an idea to your team, right? Again, that's taken it to the next step, but getting back to just looking at the job description, there's a lot of great hints that you can pull out of this stuff. Now, of course, in the education section, Right. Um, those are definitely important. Um, those are just the the straight up like, OK, this is what we need. Uh, experience in the blow is recommended. Now, a resume tip. OK, anything that you can you can look through this kind of stuff and ask yourself, what is the most important things that I have? OK. Once you come up with this stuff, look at your resume and do your very best to try to push it to the top. Right. Whether that be move bullet points around, reorganize your resume. Recruiters are looking at your resume for a short amount of time. Any kind of study you see out there is averages around seven to 10 seconds. In other words, you have seven to 10 seconds to show them that you read the job description and that your resume matches up to that. OK, so that's why it's important to kind of read through this and really understand the different aspects of it. If you look down at the bottom again, fast paced environment, right? Now, Dr. Porter was mentioning about the idea of um, the um, working at McDonald's, right? Now, <laughs> there was a recruiter that told us a long time ago, uh, one of the career fair recruiters, he came up to me and he said, Jason, he's like, students are great. He's like, I got a, I got some advice for your freshmen, though. He said, tell them to stop apologizing for being freshmen, right? And I think the reason he said that is because, you know, they would have students walk up to him and say, you know, hi, I'm Jason. Uh, sorry, I'm just a freshman, but I wanted to talk to you. Blah, blah, blah. So I think sometimes students downplay themselves before they even get started with anything. But we forget about the core element. The reason that they're looking at your profile in the first place is because you are a student, right? So, yeah, if you got together with your student group and you only raised $200, you know, from a fundraiser. Don't think that, OK, well, it's only $200. It's not it's not a lot. Why should I put it on my resume? Well, if they're asking for something like, you know, uh, must be able to you know, take the initiative, reach goals, things like that. That's a great example, because guess what? You're a student, right? If on your resume, your student resume, it says you're closing five billion dollar deals, then 
maybe you shouldn't be applying to this job, right? So don't downplay your experience. If you've worked in a fast paced environment at McDonald's, demonstrate that, right, on your resume. Those are examples you have. That's how you sell yourself on that document. You focus on what you have. Um, so I don't wanna jump into this one here. This is kind of a, a longer one, but I think there's, a, there's some things that you can kind of pull out of here as well. Um, obviously in the role description up top, you can learn a lot of stuff about what's gonna come out of the um, well, potentially a job interview, right? But who you are, right? They're breaking it down for you. Who you are, this is your key, okay? Self-starter with strong initiative, right? An accomplisher in your academics, in your contribution on campus, in your community, right? I think that's a very interesting um, bullet point there. And, you know, I know that this is, you know, kind of on the next next topic, but where do you think that you would show a contribution on campus on your resume? Student group? Are you guys part of student groups? If not, I recommend it. Highly recommend it. Why is that? Well, if you want to work here, they want to see an example of that, right? <clears throat> Have fun in your work, those around you. That's actually a great, uh, a great example of what a job interview might be like, right? You might get there and who knows, you know, they might be throwing a football around the office or something like that, right? So this is the kind of stuff to kind of look out here. Was that first line and how we work? Team projects, right? Again, getting back to that original, um, that uh, the, the NACE data, teamwork, big, big deal when it comes to this stuff. Um, fast paced culture, right? Tell them about McDonald's. It's definitely fast paced there, right? What else we got? Uh, they tell you about who they are, right? All the good stuff. Now, I'm gonna give you an example of something to point out really important. This is a pretty big job description, right? Some job descriptions are like literally just a few sentences. Um, I, you know, those are pretty terrible in my opinion. Sometimes you see those in Handshake. There's not a ton you can do, right? That's all they give you. You just do your very best on your resume, right? But one of the things that you can notice uh, in a lot of these is what degree they're looking for, okay? Now, I'll, I'll make a point that if you don't have the degree that it lists on there, make a mental note that if you apply, you can definitely apply, but you may be in the back of the line. Now, the same goes uh, as an example, if they're asking for a master's student, or let's say uh, they want a, they say we want a bachelor's, you know, someone pursuing a bachelor's degree, uh, junior, senior, you know, rising junior, rising senior, or something like that. If you're a master's student, you may be in the back of the line when you apply. Because let's go back to that intake call that recruiter's talking to that hiring manager and he's saying, hey, uh, you know, uh, for, for what you're looking for, um, you know, we could really go either way with a bachelor's or a master's degree. And, and hiring manager says, you know what, we actually had a master's student do this last year and uh, they got really bored and we just don't think it's a master's level project. Uh, we think that it's going to be more appropriate for a bachelor's level student. And so make sure that, you know, we put that in the job description as well. So again, that's why it's really important to kind of pay attention to those small details. Manage your expectations, right? If you get a rejection the next day and you knew that maybe that was kind of a stretch, just prepare yourself for that, right? Um, quickly just look at one more here. Um, some of the other states, so university student in their final year in a STEM related field. So again, if you're not, if you don't have that expected graduation date, again, ask yourself, right, I'm, I may be in the back of the line, okay? So as you go through this kind of stuff, the, 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 I think the big lesson in this is to slow down, look at the job description, ask yourself, what do I have, okay? Match your resume up to that and try your very best to organize your resume in such a way that what they're looking for is closest to the top. 
Okay. Keep your resume and you know reverse chronological order or whatever style you're writing it in, but do your very best to push the stuff to the top because that's really where you're going to catch their attention uh, in what they're looking for. Cool. All right. Thank you. All right. I will add one quick thing just to kind of tie this all together. Um, so we might potentially have first year students and are, that are watching this or first year master students or anything like that. Part of the reason you want to go through and look at the job or the job postings now, even as a first year, is to start pulling out some of these qualifications that they're asking for and figure out how can I get experiences so that when I am applying for the job, I have something that will meet that need. OK, so go out and look for the jobs, your future jobs, even if you're not looking right now, going out and looking at the job descriptions and pulling out those key details um, makes it so you can plan ahead. So, all right, with that, I would now like to introduce Andrea, uh, who is with ECS Student Services. She's going to talk to us about developing your skills at UT Dallas. Welcome. Hi, my name is Andrea Crosell Woodwick. I'm an internship coordinator with Johnson Career Services. Just like JSUM has its own career center, so does the Eric Johnson School. So if you're an ECS student, we are here to help you prepare for the job market. So a lot of what we're talking about is how to set yourself up to be a qualified candidate which means you need to know where you want to end up. So once you've reviewed your job postings and you know what type of candidate they're wanting to see, you kind of have a roadmap for how to plan your academic career so that you are a qualified candidate by the time you're ready to be on the job market. Because there are lots of different things that you can do outside of your academic coursework to set yourself up to be prepared, think about the activities that you're involved in during your academic career you can turn yourself into uh, being able to display it on your resume as showing they're qualified for the position. So some of the things that you can do on campus to help that would be to join student organizations. Um, student organization involvement, particularly major related student organization, can make a huge difference uh, in, in how the job search goes for you. Because there is such a strong emphasis on who you know, uh, knowing your peers, Additionally, uh, major related student organizations, uh, particularly in ECS fields, there are recruiters that come and re recruit specifically directly from those organizations. So those are really great places for you to know your peers, potentially interact with recruiters and uh, get really good networking experience. Projects are another area where this is how most people get jobs. So I work mostly with technical students, and so they're going to have technical resumes, which is very different from a general purpose resume. And their projects are where they're able to demonstrate that they're qualified for the position, even if they don't have prior technical work experience. So again, those major related student organizations or any basically anything you have done that demonstrates your your experience with the skills that are required for the job that you're applying to is relevant to go in your resume. Personal projects are going to be showing initiative and a dry uh, an initiative and problem solving skills in addition to the technical skills that you're demonstrating experience in. If you are able to do that, um, UTD has student leadership programs available as well. Most of the, a lot of the job descriptions you're going to be applying for are going to reference leadership and teamwork. So you want to be involved in those team activities and those team projects and leadership opportunities as well. Some other ways to get leadership experience uh, in order to be able to demonstrate that on your resume would be to uh, you can apply to be an orientation leader on campus. You can also I encourage you to um, engage with your student organizations and to uh, apply for those uh, officer positions so that you can demonstrate your leadership skills. If you're able to, I strongly encourage uh, students to participate in the EPICS program through UT Design, Engineering Projects and Community Service. It's a great opportunity for you to get teamwork experience. Uh, in your technical classes, you're going to be working with people who are from the same major, but if you're taking EPICS, you're working with students from different majors, which means the teamwork experience that you're getting from those uh, from taking EPICS means you are working with students who have different academic backgrounds, 
which means you're getting really good communication skill experience too and being able to talk about something, uh, work within the strengths uh, of, among, excuse me, have your uh, work within uh, your skill set, but also people from uh, different backgrounds so that you're able to um, communicate more effectively with them. Last, you can be strategic in your part-time jobs and on-campus employments. Think about those things like um, being able to talk about McDonald's. Absolutely, it's a fast-paced environment. Are you going to be able to talk about um, customer service experience, um, communication, teamwork, and time management, adaptability, leadership, all of the different terms that we see on job postings. Think about the different experiences that you can get on campus or in uh, through your part-time positions that you can then relate back to the job postings that you're interested in. When you get to the end of your academic career or as you're approaching the end of your academic career, uh, if you have been able to, if you, if you knew where you wanted to end up, you're able to prepare yourself for that um, much better than if you're just starting that process. Uh, in your junior to senior year. So uh, be mindful in those things as you're going through your academic career to make your job search easier. Yep. Thank you. So one thing if you haven't caught by now is that the degree by itself is not enough to get a job. OK, you need to be doing more than that. The, the degree is a qualification, but you need to be getting more experiences beyond that. Um, so. Andrea listed quite a few here. We'll also have our student panel tomorrow, which will describe some of the other ideas that they've come up with. Um, and students can be pretty creative in how they go about finding these experiences. So be sure to tune in for that. Um, and that will take us to our last speaker, uh, Beth Keithley, who's going to talk about networking since we've made such a, a big push for networking at the beginning. Welcome, Beth. Cool, thanks. So in like a frightfully like timed text. I got a text this morning from a friend of mine who works at SMU. Do I know somebody else? Yeah, I know him. Why? He's applying for a position. And he said, you're not a reference, but you work at UTD too. I was wondering if you knew him. Yeah, he's great. In fact, he applied for my job and he was so good, they gave him a different job. Now at this point, you know who got asked about, but you're the only one in the room. Oh. Ah because there's an internal candidate, but his materials look better. Now, an internal candidate usually means that's the one they're going to hire. That's just what it is. But I said, yeah, not only does his materials look better, and then I thought to myself, all right, what are going to be the main issues that a, a uh, interview manager is going to look at, or hiring manager is going to look at and say, these are issues? So I'm like, I can tell you, I know he's out of state, but he's committed to the move back. He's already got a place. He really wants to come back for Dallas because I knew that was going to be the number one issue. He's an out of town person. Really think it's worth an interview. Oh, OK, great. That's what networking is. Now, the issue is how do you get that lucky, right? Like, how do you get the friend who knows the friend who knows the thing? A few things, and I'm going to kind of spoil my slide because Andrea put it so well. Start and, and Jason did as well, but start getting involved in student organizations. You'd be surprised. Um, but there's two ways of doing it. Oh. So the challenge is how do you find the person? I did these slides before I got the slide or the text. Otherwise, I just have the text chat. It was really and just in case in point, I need you to understand how important the networking is. I have had five job, four jobs really in my life. No, five, three of which came through networking. Now I interviewed for all of them. One was a transfer from one company to the other. Here, here's somebody. We'd like her to come back to the firm. One was a friend of a, uh, the father of a friend of mine. And this was a, oh, you're interested in moving departments? I would love for you to come work for mine. Okay, so the network's the thing. Um, that doesn't mean, oh, hey, I'm never going to send out a resume because I'm just going to wait for the my network to work, but while you're sending out the resumes, while you're doing the job search, while you're doing that thing, and I never sent my 15 minutes alone, while you're doing that thing, start talking to the people, work your network, make it happen. It's a two-step process. First of all, you've got to ask yourself, who do you know, or who do you know through somebody else? 
And then who do you wish you knew? And they have many substats, obviously, because you're like, uh. So let's walk through the exercise for the first process first. You're not going to do it right now. I don't recommend, well, you can do it right now if you want. You're adults, do what you wish. Draw three circles with a dot. The dot, the center dot is you. That's you. Then in the circle around that, people who like, you will do a favor for, they will do a favor for you. Your best friend, your parents, your siblings, your significant other, perhaps your significant other siblings. Those people who you're going to, they're part of your network. You feel really good about them. When you're having a bad hair day, you're still going to talk to them. In the second circle, they're weaker ties. They're your former colleagues, school classmates, professors, friends of friends that you went to that birthday party with for your best friend and you kind of got to know them, but maybe you didn't. Oh, now you're Facebook friends. That's kind of the second circle. And then the third circle are mostly Kevin, uh, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, the sort of people you could get to eventually. Um, you know, the people your parents know, not necessarily, but who your professor knows, who your parents know, those sort of theoretically I could get in touch with them. You want to start networking with your weak ties. So these are the people that you kind of know, but you lost touch with. Now, keep in mind, this isn't just, hey, my best friend, I went to my best friend's birthday party and there was this person, but that I guess I should connect with because then that would be a part of my network. These are all people that you're interested in what they do or interested in where they work or just sort of, I believe this could be somebody who could know a thing. This is the, the work. These are the groups you want to meet with first. They're just a little easier to get a hold of. There's not quite the cold call aspect to it. And you need less of a, a thing to offer because that can be a holdup for people with networking. Because one of the things you want to do when you're networking, you do the informational network and you're like, hey, I'd like to talk to you about how you got here. Great. But you also need to be able to go in and say, hey, I'm part of a student leadership group. Do you have some articles we could share? Or, hey, I could get them to retweet your art, you know, your article, your thing. You have to bring something to the table. It doesn't have to be huge. It can be little. And usually it's some sort of publicity. I can get you access to these people. You let me into my network. You get into my network. And my network has all these benefits. Look at these people I can get you in touch with. Even if you're like, okay, none of my friends are powerful. Not right now. But most people who are going to do informational interviews either do them because they're very nice and just will. Or because they really do like to network and grow the network and like to see potential. So there's always that opportunity. So then who do you wish you knew? I recommend joining a professional organization outside the student group. There are usually student memberships. Definitely take advantage. Keep in mind, there are so many. There's the National Association of Fellowship Advisors. There is insert, there are three organizations for grant writers that is, are outside the fellowship advisors. Like I could be part of like six um, industry groups, which is crazy, but Google it sometime. It's there. Ask your friends, family, acquaintance to introduce you to the people they know. Um, Again, especially if that they're on that third ring, that is the best way to do it. Um, to the earlier point about the sort of letters of recommendation and application, you kind of want to say why. Like, hey, Dad, could you introduce me to that friend of yours who's that engineer for Peloton? Because that would be cool. And if I have to hear that story one more time about how you know some of the Peloton, I'm going to... So it's about time you ponied up. It's like, why? Well, I want to do an informal interview because, as you know, I'm coming to the last year and it'd be really nice to talk to them about their opportunities. OK, great. That's a good way to do it. Another way to find people to contact, and we'll talk in a second about how to actually contact them, is to Google the company you want to work for. Don't contact the CEO. I mean, yeah, Elon Musk is probably on Twitter a lot, but he's not going to answer your DMs. So just let it 
put a slide. Don't go to HR either. Unless you are actually getting a degree in human resources management, no one in HR believes you want an informational interview. Ever. Don't do it. If you have a mutual connection, you can work at that. That's, and I've got an email example at the end. Hey, I got your name from X. Let me talk to you about it. UTD Career Center, the JSON Career Center, ECS Student Services probably have a few suggestions like, hey, is there an engineer that ECS is friends with? And ECS would be like, oh, let's get so much more specific, but they'll be able to help you and kind of work that network aspect to it. Pay attention to Twitter, Facebook, blogs. Follow people on Twitter that you are in, whose companies you are interested in. You would, again, be surprised about the general kindness of people who will be like, hey, I'm at an airport and I have an hour. Ask me your random questions. That happens more often than you'd think, and you can kind of you can work at it that way. And you can always email them, send them a message, or just leave a comment like, hey, this article that you wrote was great, really meant a lot to me. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more. So I've done the whole like, you've got to find these people. Once you find them, know your goals so that when somebody says, yeah, I'd like to talk to you, what do you want to talk about? You do something more than, I need a job. What is, what is the information you want to get from these people? I'm in computer science, but I've seen job descriptions for mathematics. I feel like I'm a fit, but maybe, and you have the mathematics and you're in computer science, I'd really like to talk to you about how you manage that. That's extremely specific, but it gives you an example. I recommend the 15 minute meeting. Really like the 15 minute meeting. Oh, 15, I've got 15 minutes. I mean, I don't have an hour for lunch or an hour and a half for lunch, but I have 15 minutes. And what you can do in 15 minutes is get started. Hey, let me send you that. You're right. Let me send you that. Hey, let's do this. And you respect the 15 minutes. Hey, I only have you for 15 minutes, but maybe we could talk again. You'd be surprised how that starts the role. And then again, you've got this person in the network you're communicating with them. Find some mentors. Be willing to be extroverted or just talk to people. Don't wait for people to come to you. Do a little bit of non-creepy research. You're at a conference and it says like, Beth Keithley, UTD. Hey, I want to talk to you about UTD. I saw on your name tag, you go to UTD. Can we talk about that? Sure. If you come up to somebody in the name tag, go, hey, I saw on Facebook that you were just in Copenhagen. No, but the whole like, I read your name badge and have some follow-up questions, perfectly acceptable and a nice way to get started. And I mentioned this before about getting ready to share. Have something, a connection. Hey, you went to UTD2 or something like, hey, I know this or, oh, you're in computer, you know, you're in computer science or you're in management. You interested in this? I can get you in touch with these people. You have more to offer than you think you do. And I'm saying this because everyone has more to offer in networking than they think they do because they come into the network like I need a job. I have to talk to you so I can eventually get a job. I have nothing. You don't. You have access to other people and you can help them build the network. To that end, LinkedIn isn't always the answer. And I know I'm about to get like killed by the LinkedIn gods here, but see where people are and talk to them there. When in doubt, contact them by email. But if there's a person who is never on LinkedIn, despite the profile, but they are always, they're always on their blog. They always have a website. They're always on Instagram. They're always on TikTok. That's where you contact them because they are not going to get back to you in LinkedIn. They also really probably won't believe that you're paying attention to it. Like I've contacted you through the site you're never on. I'm a huge fan. Are you though? So just kind of go to them where they are. When in doubt, LinkedIn and email are the professional options for sure. So how do you do it? And I shared my screens or I shared my slides specifically so that you could have these. This is the template. If you're familiar with the Princess Bride, it will be easy for you. If you are not, it will not be. But this is especially the verbal contact. You polite greeting. Hello. Name. My name is Inigo Matoya. You introduce yourself right at the top. A relevant personal link. This is basically the how you got my name. Why are you interested in me? What is going on? Now, in the case of the personal Princess Bride is you killed my father. It's probably you went to UTD or whatever. And then manage expectations. I'd like to talk to you about your job here. Prepare to die. 
You make it work in your own way. And I have about two seconds left. So this is just an example of an email. This is actually an informal interview request from a Harvard Law School student. I did that specifically so it would be useless to everybody, <laughs> but the model is still there, starting with the, um, but that being said, you'd be surprised that, you know, somebody at UTD suggested I contact you. That's often a very good connection right there. Oh, okay, I know Andrea, cool. Suggested that I contact you, introduced himself, talked about what he was interested in, gave him a little thing, you know, a little blurb, and then I realize you're in a tight schedule and I'd appreciate any time that you could spare to meet with me. Contact information there. That's how you do it. With that, the words of the great James T. Kirk, phasers on stun, good luck, Kirk out. But go get your network, build it up. With that, I'm gonna get out of the way. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. If you even go to the main campus or somewhere, like how would you like introduce? Like how would you ask for favors? Like if I know some people, I go to the main campus for online events. Uh, I met some people who are working for the company, having the same interest. Uh huh. And uh, then like how would you ask? For, like give me a referral. Like so you're just asking. So it's people. Uh, what is your experience with them? Uh, like. I had met them on Tuesday, like I go to the church, so I met on Tuesday with them. Okay. Yeah, and they're working at the company, and like as as for the same interest, like they're also working for technology. I'm also like, how would you ask for a favor? Like, well, so you know, Beth, could you paraphrase the question so we can hear? Uh, so the question is, how do you ask somebody for a favor? I ask somebody for a favor. So it's a. It's a friend of a friend and how do you ask for a favor? So like the connection for the yeah. job, um, you don't put it that way. I need a favor is not, but you say like, oh, hey, you work at X, you work at this company. Oh, that's so cool. I would love to hear about, and then whatever your favor is. Like, I would love to talk to you more and more of that. Oh my gosh, working there would be amazing. Do you have any ideas about the best way? How did you get your job there? So you figure out, ways to phrase a question so that you get the information. That kind of goes to the goal about goal setting. So it's not just, hey, get me a job. It's how did you get your job? Um, what are the best ways to figure out openings there? That can be a really good question. So it's not, I'm asking for something. I'm. If you ask me for a job, I don't hire, I can't help. There are very few people in the company who actually can hire but I can give you all kinds of information about how to do it. So that's how you do it. You go at it from the like, how can I find about other openings? Are there any net professional networks that I should really, groups that I should really be part of? Just kind of ask those questions that way so that you're not asking for something that these people can't provide and they can always provide opinions and suggestions. That makes sense? Yeah. I mean, it's it's not awesome. It's not like, hey, can you give me a job? But if you say, hey, can you give me a job? The answer is going to usually be no. Yeah. So you're not asking for a favor. You're asking for information. You're asking for stories. You're asking for opinions. You're asking for advice. Those work much smoothly. You can do a, hey, can you introduce me? But that's about as close as you want to get to like, do this, do me this solid. People like to talk about themselves. And to hear that they make good life choices. <laughs> like, oh my God, you work there. It's amazing. Like if you continue the conversation for clients, they usually say if you do something and I I give a recommendation, so they know usually if you are coming to seek my job. Uh, are we not from like a self like that? Absolutely. So they have to get to know you a little bit before they could be willing to put their neck on the line. I like that's a big part of it. So it's it's fostering and building that relationship. Yeah, and just ability of what they can do. Yeah. There's a lot people can do. Maybe not giving you a job directly, but there's a lot they can do. Um, and I will say, so Texas is a really weird state in so many ways. Um, it kind of has this off-putting demeanor sometimes, uh, but the people in Texas are usually really friendly and willing to talk to people oh, yeah. on a personal level. So I've known many people who have gotten informational interviews with CEOs that they didn't know were CEOs through like their gym. Right? They work out with this person, they're in the same group, and they just kind of were talking with them. It's like, oh, you do exactly what I want to do. Let's talk professionally, right? 
Um, so Texas is one of those few places where you can actually turn to the person in the grocery line and talk to them and they're not going to punch you in the face. Usually, usually. Don't quote me. <laughs> um, but OK, well, that is everything we have. If there are any questions, any more questions or questions online, um, I think we have a few minutes so we could probably answer them. Um, do you all have any questions? Uh, it's uh, just a reminder too that LinkedIn Learning actually has some really good videos on this subject. So LinkedIn, the career centers, plural. Um, you see things about this all the time, so a big part of it is just take advantage of it. Right? You have a lot of resources available to you. Yeah. So, so all this hiring process, is it the same to all these chemicals uh, everywhere? Is it the same process? A lot of it carries over, yes. A lot of it is fairly common. Um, so for me, I'm in the bioengineering department. I focus primarily on bioengineering, but a lot of the things that work there are everywhere. Um, there might be subtle differences here and there, but for the most part, yeah, I would say it carries over. Does that sound right to you all? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, st uh, STEM students that get jobs directly from the career fairs. Uh, companies come here, you know, to, to BCS and do uh, information sessions. You know, they're not just doing that because they're being nice. They're doing that to meet you in person, give you a chance to learn about the company and teach you how to get hired. But um, so like uh, as a professor, like there are some questions like behaviors kind of like you have not worked before, but there are questions like tell me a time when you work with a team or Tell me a time like when you feel like perfection or something ago. Like how to answer that kind of question. So the question is how do you answer behavioral questions? Yeah. I don't know. Never say I don't know. So the way that I tell my students, the question was, if you've never encountered something and they're asking you about it, how do you answer that? Yeah. Um, chances are you've worked on a team, even if it's just been a student group. OK, so reflect back on that. When I say never say I don't know, you can say I don't know. OK, I take that back. You can say I don't know, but then you have to explain how would you would figure it out? OK, so when they ask, give us a time that you've worked on a team, think of anything. OK. They want an example of showing that you know how to do it or you know how to go find how to do it. So tell us, um, do you know how to write in Java? I don't know, I don't do programming, right? Assuming that I'm a programmer and I write in a bunch of other languages, um, it may be, well, I've had some experience with Java. It's not something that I'm great at, but I know how to go find resources to develop it better and it's something I can pick up quickly, right? You never just want to say, no or I don't know or just leave it hanging right so that's that's been my experience with it is that also feel free to contradict I'm not <laughs> so uh, so he asked about yeah like so is having a conflict in a team is it going to be positive on you or negative okay that's what's that the, the answer to the conflict question yeah the answer to the conflict question Unless it's a bold faced lie for you. Is <laughs> you don't, the answer is obviously you try to stop conflicts at the source. So you always talk with the person because usually it's not really a conflict. I mean, we're all on the same team, mm -hmm. right? So what I try to do is sit down with that person and figure out the perspective that they're coming from because usually if I understand what's happening and that I'm coming from a different perspective, we can find some neutral ground and then we work forward. Now let's say that doesn't happen. If that doesn't happen, then what I tend to do, and I hate to do it, but sometimes you have to, I will kind of talk to my supervisor and I'll ask my I'll explain this situation to my supervisor and I'll ask for tips on how to work with this person. Because again, we're on the same team. I want to make sure we're working together to insert goal of the company here. Usually at that point, it really has figured itself out. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always willing to, to talk it through with somebody and understand where they're coming from and not just insist on my way. That I, that I think comes from not only you know understanding that we're all on the same team 
but trying to be a professional and work in a friendly environment where we're all like a like a team. When it comes to those kinds of questions, figure out what it is that they're actually asking. Okay, so they may be asking on the face, have you ever had a conflict in a team? The real question is, how would you deal with conflict on a team? So yeah, everybody's had a conflict on a team. Like it's just, that it happens. Even if it's just, I'm working with Beth and I'm like, I disagree. Like Beth, you're wrong, right? How are you gonna work through that? Tell us about your greatest weakness. Everybody has a weakness. Okay, don't give the canned answer of, well, I, I'm too much of a perfectionist or something like that. They see straight through that crap, okay? You can come up with a real weakness. Not You don't want to tell them like you're a raging alcoholic or anything like that. I wouldn't go for like something that's just kind of like that that shut off. But, but you do want to come up with a real weakness, but also how are you solving it? How are you getting past it? Can you show real growth there? Like how do you get past the weakness? So it's always with all the negative questions that seem like you don't want to answer affirming that there was a negative, confirming that there was something bad that went on. Figure out how to make it positive, figure out how to show that you grew from it. So that's that's typically what I think with those behavioral answers. Don't use the canned ones, like the ones that everybody recommends online where they're like, this is exactly how you answer it. Don't do that. OK, get to the heart of what they're asking. I mean, it's, it's better to have a story how I overcome that. Oh, yes. Yeah. You can prepare for their questions, knowing that they're going to ask about your weakness or knowing they're going to ask you about a time with a conflict and have an, uh, something ready to go. Um, that's fine, but make it personal. Make sure you're addressing the root question. Make sure you're reading the job description to fill out the team. Like the one, the job description that Jason filled is like, we're a family and we do quarterly get togethers and things like that. If they ask you what you do in your spare time, do not want to answer with, I sit in a room by myself and do this. You are not part of the environment. Now, obviously, you would probably not apply when you saw all these like ego camping and you're like, oh, no, never. But you do want to walk in with some of the key points, so some of the ideas of what you, Jason's point, what you think the company wants you to have. And, answer, and to, to Ben's point, to answer all those questions in a way that shows you're a good fit. So yeah, what are they really asking? Are you a team? Just when somebody says you're wrong. I'm asking if there's any questions online. Do you have any more questions? So we talk about voluntary, voluntary things like how it can affect in your prison your life. Does it have to be academic related for voluntary stuff or any like? Other outside of academia. You're trying to make yourself stand out, mm -hmm. right? Just getting the degree isn't enough. Um, so yeah, doing other things outside of academia, absolutely. Yeah. So one, one time I went to webinar and they said something like, for example, if you if you put something like a faith faith based voluntary things, mm. it can backfire sometimes. Okay. So the comment was, if you put a faith-based faith uh, experience or something like that online, or something that shows more of your personal information, mm -hmm. um, that that can backfire, and that's true. You open, well, yeah, well, always, you know, the recruiter bias. Yeah. You know, just the same way that they might look at someone's last name. Yep. Or, you know, in JSON, we encourage them to put the eligibility statement at the bottom, because everybody gets that question, and now in the future with our sponsorship. Sometimes if it's at the bottom, you know, that I can work, you know, 36 months without sponsorship, you know, there's sometimes that bias. You know. It is what it is. What is that? Well, that's a STEM, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, yeah, like OBP. It's, okay. it's the eligibility statement that we have students put at the bottom of the resume. So uh, I'm, I'm a national student, so I will probably use my OBP. Mm -hmm. so, so sometimes when you put that mm -hmm. on there, it would, you know that that may get you automatically rejected. Oh, uh, you know that's I mean there's a, that, there's a whole other conversation when it comes to that stuff. But um, yeah, I mean there's things on your resume that can automatically cause you know bias and things like that. But those are the uncontrollable elements. You know you can just do your best by putting your your best effort 
you know, into whatever you're passionate. I mean, if you're passionate about the faith-based stuff, then go for it. You know. I mean, uh, which is a very sober question. Like, uh, like, do you want to uh, sponsorship? Like, Will you now in future? Yeah. 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 Like, what should we answer? Like, well, like that's going to be up to you. Like, um, if I want to like go back to India, like after I'm just like if I want to go back to India, like in five years, so why should I do like yes, I need sponsorship? Well, I I I already have like three or something. Well, I think that there there are certain times where you have to be careful about that because there are some companies that may have say that they um, that they only hire if you're a legal resident or a citizen. Oh yeah. And sometimes they can make exceptions depending upon sure. what team it's going to be filled in. And then sometimes they say that, and it's a hard and fast rule. So depending upon how you answer that question can affect how far along you get in the application process. It is entirely possible to answer that question no when it should have been yes. Go through the uh, the application, the interview process, get the job, stop all of your other interviews and application process, interview processes, accept a position, go to get your CPT approval, only for them to say, we can't hire you. Yeah. We cannot issue, we can't hire you as an intern because you're eventually going to need OPT. We had that happen this past, uh, just last week. So yeah, we it's know. one of those things yeah. where... You, you need to have it somewhere on your resume. You need to be able to ensure that you're answering those questions correctly. If there's any question about it, try to find try to find a recruiter to talk to. Try to ver verify with the employer to see are you a company that can make exceptions or is it a hard one? Whatever the company is is hiring you on the long term. Yeah. Right. Sometimes students okay. I only I only want to use my CPT or I only want to use my OPT. But a company is going to spend a lot of time and energy hiring you. They want they their investment. They want to keep. There's probably not a lot of company unless it's a real specific agreement or like a like a contract like a contract hire. There's not a lot of companies out there that I don't think that you'd say. Well, I only want to work here for three years and then I'll leave, right? Because then they're going to be like, well, we want someone that's going to stay for for longer. Right? So if we need a sponsorship, even if we have OPT, we better we should mention that we need a sponsorship. But the question is, what happens? There's the question they're asking is what happens after your student status expires? All right, all right. That's that's really what they're asking in that question. That's the in the future part. Yeah. And a lot of this does come back down to that that networking again, because if they already believe that you're like the bee's knees, is that the, why is that the thing? Mm -hmm. The bee's knees. But if they already believe that you're solid gold, and they have said that they don't hire that in the past, they will sometimes look past it. Right, like they're saying, so they will make exceptions. So it's that networking, getting to know them, kind of finding your ways in. Um, yeah. There are companies that will say they do not hire citizens, but they always show up on the list of people hiring. Yeah. Bank of America. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So we are running over. Um, so I'm gonna try to wrap this up for everybody online um thank you for coming this is our email addresses if you want to get hold of any of us uh if you haven't yet please do take a second to go out and fill out that tiny url or to scan that qr code just to let us know who you were um and we'll be back tomorrow same time same place with our student panel to talk about how you can find more of these experiences uh and and build up your skills for for that resume um thank you all thank you all for coming Store, but you can go out that door. Like, I think, I don't know. It's hard to find these beautiful.